So, so let me just quickly remind you what we did uh, last time. We introduced uh, the class of polynomial time solvable problems and polynomial time computable functions, right? Um, and also the presumably larger class of uh, non-deterministically uh, solvable decision problems. Uh, so how to think about, uh, about that? So uh, polynomial time prob solvable problems are simply uh, problems whose, uh, given any input, you can decide uh, whether this uh, input has uh, proper, the property uh, asserted right or not uh, using a program that terminates always in polynomially many steps in the length of the input, uh, right? If input is a number, we saw that the length we measure is simply the number of bits of this number or number of digits uh, in decimal. Uh, this makes, uh, uh, this cannot change the uh, asymptotics of the runtime. Uh, so what, how, how to think about NP decision problems? Well, we define them as essentially uh, problems that can be verified given a good guess, right? This might uh, sound uh, um, a little bit funny, right? What is a good guess? Essentially, they are problems that assert existence of an object with a property that is verifiable in polynomial time. So, for example, input can be a graph, and the property of that graph is that it has a Hamiltonian cycle, right? What is a Hamiltonian cycle? It's simply a tour of all the vertices that visits every vertex exactly once and then returns uh, into the starting uh, vertex, right? So <coughs> the question, the property then, an NP property would be the graph has a Hamiltonian circuit, right? Um, how is this uh, uh, verifiable given a good guess? Well, the guess would be the candidate for the Hamiltonian circuit, right? So if I give you a graph and a permutation of its vertices, you can check in polynomial time. So if I give you a graph G uh, and a permutation of vertices V pi of one, uh, V uh, pi of two, right, and so forth, V pi of n, if we have n vertices, right? If I give you uh, such a permutation, then you can check in polynomial time if uh, this is really a permutation, if all vertices are distinct, and whether uh, each edge of V pi, uh, V pi i plus one, if this edge uh, contains, is contained in the list uh, of uh, edges, right? So, um, so the question whether G has a uh, uh, Hamiltonian circuit is solvable if I give you a good guess, namely a guess of a permutation of vertices so that uh, all the edges, uh, right, this is uh, vertex pi of one, uh, vertex pi of two, and so forth. And you can check whether indeed uh, um, all the edges between two uh, consecutive vertices belong to E, right? And in general, that's the way to think the, this uh, good guess is actually the object most often, not necessarily, but most often this is just the guess is really the object that has these properties. Another example would be <coughs> um, a propositional formula, as we saw last time, that is in conjunctive normal form, right? So it's uh, something that is a conjunction 
right, of several disjunctions so that here uh, you either have a letter or a negated letter and so forth, right? So um, the question, uh, the problem that says formula has a sat uh, satisfying assignment is obviously in NP because a good guess would be simply a mapping of uh, propositional letters, uh, right, into truth uh, and falsity. Uh, because then in polynomial time, you can compute the value of every bracket and then, of course, the value of the whole conjunction given the, the assignment of variables. So polynomial time are things that are solvable. Uh, and uh, in polynomial time, NP things are those that are, whether something is, solu is a solution to that problem is verifiable in polynomial time. So, um, and as we mentioned intuitively, checking whether something is a solution should be harder to, sorry, uh, is much easier to do than finding out if there exists some assignment of variables uh, that makes this true because potentially there are, I mean, not potentially, there are exponentially many assignments, right? Zero, one, truth, falsity sequences. So by brute force, it would take exponential amount of time. So, um, but if I give you a good guess, namely a satisfying assignment, then this is verifiable in polynomial time. And as I said, remarkably, even though intuitively uh, finding out if there exists an assignment at all should be much harder than just simply checking whether an assignment uh, makes a formula true uh, or not, right? But no one can prove that. Uh, and this is this phase must uh, P is equal or not equal to NP problem. And there were actually examples in the past, for example, <coughs> property uh, P is a composite number, right? P is not a prime number. It was believed for a while to be, uh, not to be in P, right? Uh, because uh, factoring of numbers is uh, such a hard problem. Uh, that we use in cryptography, right? And obviously, P is a, comp a composite number, is in NP. Why? Because P is a composite number, just in case uh, there, are, there is a number M different from one and different from P, so that M divides P, right? So if I give you a candidate uh, uh, namely a number M, you can just run regular uh, division procedure right in linear time in the length of P and verify if that number divides uh, uh, P. Uh, uh, but uh, then in 2002, uh, it was proved, right, <coughs> that uh, be, being a prime number and then automatically not being a prime number, right, is uh, actually in P, right? And the uh, un, un polynomial time algorithm was found that can test uh, um, whether a number is prime or not. So it's not that, um, uh, you know, uh, it's pretty reasonable then to ask the question, is it maybe true that any NP problem is in P? Maybe there is, uh, some fancy procedure um, uh, that, in fact, uh, um, uh, some fancy procedure that determines uh, whether a formula is satisfiable or not in polynomial time, uh, and we just are not able to, to discover it yet. But uh, uh, as time progressed, a huge amount of effort was uh, invested in both trying to um, 
uh, well, mostly into trying to prove that NP is strictly uh, larger than P, but despite all these efforts, uh, we got more or less nowhere so far. But majority of people, uh, we do it as a working assumption that P is in fact uh, not equal to NP, and so that uh, if you have an NP problem, you should not try uh, to, uh, to solve it, but look for other solutions that uh, might solve your problem. So, um, uh, another large class of problems, even larger than this, are NP problems, uh, sorry, NP hard problems. And they are mostly important for optimization problems that are not decision problems. Uh, what would be an optimization problem? Well, the best example is the traveling salesman problem. If you are given a map with the distances between vertices, any pair of vertices, your task is to find a, a cycle through this graph going along the edges uh, of the graph so that the sum of the distances traveled is as small as possible. So this is clearly not a yes, no problem, but we would like to kind of measure the complexity of such problems and determine whether they are uh, as hard as uh, NP complete problems. So we introduce a notion of NP hardness. What is NP hardness? Well, think about uh, your computer if it, you add it uh, 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 some magic uh, coprocessor that can answer uh, questions, uh, for example, um, uh, uh, a question um, about, uh, say, any open problem that uh, your favorite problem. For example, we might even take the question, uh, if you give it a formula, it can output yes or no, whether that formula has uh, um, uh, satisfying assignment or not. Uh, so then NP hard problems uh, would be problems that if you had a coprocessor solving that problem, then any NP problem can be solved in polynomial time using standard uh, operations that we always use when we write programs, plus queries uh, to that process, uh, coprocessor, querying an oracle for that problem. And we say that, um, so the, the ability to solve uh, that problem would allow you to solve these um, NP-complete problems which we consider intractable. <coughs> so, clearly a uh, uh, traveling salesman problem is in fact uh, a uh, NP hard problem, the optimization problem, because uh, um, you could solve uh, um, the traveling uh, salesman problem that is uh, um, uh, the, the decision traveling salesman problem for which we know that is intractable. So, um, when we measure the complexity of decision problems, we introduced the, the notion of polynomial time reducibility. What is this? Uh, well, essentially, this is how you compare the diffic how difficult it is to solve uh, a problem compared to difficulty to solve another problem, right? So say, uh, if you have a problem U, and the problem V, then clearly, so these will be instances where not V is true, and here would be instances that V is true, and here are instances that not U is true, and inside of this bubble is uh, instances that U is true. So then, intuitively, it's very reasonable to say that this problem is not harder than that problem, if you can find a polynomial time computable function that for each input x produces an output f of x in polynomial time 
so that x is a yes instance of v, namely here, just in case f of x is a yes instance and x is a not instance of v, just in case uh, f of x is a not instance of u. Because uh, why, this, why does this make uh, this problem not harder than that? Because if you had an oracle that solves u, right, then you could automatically solve v in the, almost the same amount of time, namely in polynomial time plus the time that this oracle takes, right? Uh, maybe it's a, usually we charge a single uh, step querying uh, the oracle. So because to answer the question whether x satisfies v, you simply compute f of x and call the oracle uh, for you. And so then we saw that uh, uh, there is inside that uh, NP uh, problems have a, a subclass uh, that has a very important property that it's universal. In what sense? Uh, so if this is a collection of all NP problems, then there exists a class and we of course don't know whether it's a proper class <coughs> uh, so that uh, um, so that any NP problem, V, can be uh, reduced to, um, to uh, that particular uh, NP complete uh, problem U, say. Right? So they are universal because if you had an algorithm that solves problem U, you could solve any other NP problem simply by using a polynomial time computable uh, function that reduces every instance of V to an instance of U so that uh, truth and falsity are uh, preserved, right? And uh, big, uh, big fundamental theorem of this uh, field of computational complexity theory is uh, the so-called it's called Cook's theorem that shows that, in fact, the question of satisfiability of a formula is NP-complete. And uh, later today in the extended course, we will see uh, the proof of, uh, of that theorem. Um, so um, the question about any NP problem, for example, the question does a graph G have a vertex cover of size K is in fact reducible so there is a polynomial time computable function that reduces each instance of vertex cover to a propositional formula that has the property that your original graph has vertex cover of size K just in case the formula has a satisfying assignment. Uh, yes? So if uh, V can be um, polynomially useful to you, can you uh, go other way around and be polynomially useful to you? Uh, okay, so if that's the case, then they would be equivalent. And lo and behold, uh, this, what you say, happens precisely for NP-complete problems. Any two NP-complete problems are mutually reducible to each other. Right, and uh, one can show, this is so-called the Ladner theorem, that uh, if P is not equal to NP, then there are also intermediate problems, namely uh, problems that are in NP, not in P, and not complete. So the ordering of difficulty, so if P is not equal to NP, then there are various degrees of difficulties in between. Neither full-blown NP-complete, no, not a universal problem, and not just computable in polynomial time. So, um, how do we, so why, why is it important uh, to figure out if a problem is uh, NP-hard or NP-complete? or not for a practicing computer scientist? Well, uh, simply because if it turns out that the problem is NP-hard, 
then it makes really no sense uh, to try to solve it exactly because in all likelihood uh, there is no feasible polynomial time algorithm that solves that problem. And as we mentioned the last time, uh, it is not just a, a propositional formula, satisfiability of prop a propositional formula, an example of, a, of an NP-complete problem. There are problems uh, that are practically very important and that are NP-hard. And uh, one of the problems that we mentioned is uh, uh, traveling salesman optimization problem, namely uh, if you have a map with distances, pairways, distances between the locations, right, uh, then uh, finding a, a tour of all the vertices that is of minimal total length is an example of an NP-hard problem. Uh, the other NP-hard problem is uh, the set covering problem, right? If you uh, remember, if you have a, a list of movies uh, whose DVDs you want to buy, and you have a list of uh, bundles of DVD movies, uh, and you know that uh, all the movies from your list are in some of the bundles, maybe in multiple bundles, and maybe some bundles contain more than one movie that you want to get, <coughs> selecting the subset of these bundles that has all the movies that you want and that is as cheap as possible is an NP-hard problem. So, I mean, if I told you uh, here is a problem, you know, I gave you, you are given a list of bundles with list of movie, movies that they have, and uh, their prices uh, um, and a list of movies, select the cheapest uh, collection of bundles. It's very tempting to try to solve something like this because it doesn't sound esoteric at all. It sounds like something that should be easily solvable. But lo and behold, uh, trying to do it uh, is futile, right? Because uh, uh, in all likelihood, uh, there is no feasible algorithm for that. So that's the reason why we are doing um, NP-hardness, because uh, such problems do appear in practice, uh, and it's important to uh, recognize them, right, so that you don't waste your time trying to solve them exactly. So what do we do when we encounter an NP-hard problem, right? <clears throat> After all, if you are running a logistics company, you know, if you are, uh, say, delivering newspapers to certain addresses, uh, uh, right, you are not going to give up uh, your business because you cannot find what's the optimal route for your delivery boy to, uh, to get the, the papers to, uh, to all the addresses you have to find a solution in a reasonable amount of time, in polynomial time, that is not too bad. And ideally, <coughs> you want to find a solution that is, uh, for example, for your delivery person, say that the total length uh, is not, uh, not uh, worse than twice the the, max, the, the optimal length. Uh, or, for example, we saw last time that um, uh, for vertex cover, right, for vertex cover, uh, we can always choose, uh, uh, even though we cannot solve it exactly, we cannot find the, sm the se a set of smallest size that uh, does the covering we can find a set that is uh, at most twice as large, right? And this is a typical application of uh, an approximation algorithm. Just let me remind you, the algorithm is a little bit counterintuitive. What you do is if you have a graph, right, 
uh, what you do is you take an arbitrary edge and somewhat counterintuitively you pick both of its ends for your vertex cover. You color both of its ends and then you remove all the edges that are incident to one of the ends, right? So you would end up in this case in a situation that uh, uh, you, you took these two edges, all of these edges are gone, and so you will have in the remainder what will be in the remainder something like this, right? All of the edges that are attached to either this or this uh, vertex are gone. And then you repeat this procedure, you take another uh, edge and you color, sorry, another, yes, another edge and you color both ends and then you drop uh, the remaining uh, uh, edges that are incident to at least one of the ends and uh, you do that for as long as there are, uh, um, uh, for as long as there are edges that neither of the ends are colored. So clearly at the end you will end up only with a collection of edges whose both ends are, are colored, right? Uh, and the claim is that choosing the vertices of these edges is, uh, there can be no more than twice the minimal vertex cover. Why is that so? Well, uh, clearly, this is a vertex cover because uh, all the edges uh, that have, uh, will have at least, all other edges will have at least one um, vertex within the chosen set because they were removed, right? We always remove edges whose at least, whose one end is, is colored. So this is a vertex cover and it cannot be of the size more than twice the optimal cover. Why? Well, clearly these edges that we produce are disjoint in the sense they cannot share the same vertex, right? Because when an edge shares a vertex with a chosen edge, we remove it in the process, right? So these are disjoint uh, segments and any vertex cover has to cover at least one end of uh, these disjoint segments, right? So Consequently, the, 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 your vector cover has both ends and any vertex cover has to choose at least one. So clearly your uh, choice is not more than twice the minimal, uh, the minimal choice. And this is a um, kind of uh, a repeating uh, uh, theme. Uh, so now the question is, uh, okay, maybe this uh, solves the problem. Maybe for all uh, NP-hard problems, you can come up with uh, an algorithm that produces uh, a reasonably good solution, like here, not more than twice as large as the minimal one, in polynomial time. But, uh, Unfortunately, um, finitary combinatorics is a very cruel thing. Even this is not true, right? So uh, let us first see uh, examples of, uh, of a problem. And it is very subtle when this is possible and when this is not possible. So we will first consider uh, what's called metric uh, traveling uh, salesman uh, problem. What is a metric traveling salesman problem? Again, you are given a map, right? Uh, and pairwise distances between all of the vertices, uh, right? And they have the following property. 
metric in the sense that this is a correct metric in the, as a metric space, namely that if you have any three vertices, say V, so U, V, and W, then you have the property, the distance between U and V, <coughs> plus distance between V and W is bigger or equal than distance between U and W, right? So the triangle inequality, if you go uh, uh, this way from U to V, and then you go from V to W, the total length of this, uh, uh, the sum total of these distances must be larger or equal than the distance, direct distance between uh, uh, U and W, right? This would be true if your traveling salesman is, for example, an aerial drone, right? Because uh, then the distance between U and V is just Euclidean distance, right? You can fly straight from U to V. But notice if these are roads, uh, this does not have to be the case because maybe you have a, a winding road here and then a straight road like here. And it just happens that this distance is larger than some of uh, uh, these distances. So it turns out that whether your whether you are doing delivery by aerial drones or you are using a roadmap uh, makes a big difference. So we will show that traveling salesman, metric traveling salesman problem has a two approximation. Namely, even though in general <coughs> it is not possible to find minimal uh, the, uh, the path of uh, the, the cycle of minimal total distance, you can always find a uh, cycle that is uh, at most twice as large as the minimal cycle. How do we do that? It's a very clever construction. First, what you do is uh, you find a minimal spanning tree for your graph, right? So simply find the minimal spanning tree of your graph, say something that looks like that. And let's now estimate the size of uh, this minimal spanning tree. You see, uh, let uh, say uh, L be the, uh, well, let's not call it L, let's call it opt. Let opt be the total length of a cycle that, that is as short as possible, right? So, uh, this is the holy grail, right? It's uh, the optimal solution that we cannot find in polynomial time, unfortunately. Let opt be uh, this, uh, the length of this root. Well, my claim is obviously opt cannot be um, shorter than uh, the size of, uh, of minimal spanning tree. Why is this the case? What do you think? Why an optimal root can never be shorter than the total length of the minimal spanning tree? Hmm? Brilliant. So for, if you remove any of the edges, right, then of course opt is bigger or equal than opt minus the uh, length of uh, any edge, right? You remove one edge. But if you remove one edge, what remains is a spanning tree, right? 
because it visits every vertex and it's a trivial spanning tree that uh, has no branching, right? So opt mine must be bigger than uh, a size, uh, let's just call it abuse notation and call it MST, Sp size of the minimal spanning tree, okay? Now we do the following trick. We do depth first search to traverse all the vertices. So I'll start from here, then go here, then go here, then go back, go here, go here, then go here, right? So simply depth first traversal of the tree. So this is, of course, not uh, a correct route for our traveling salesman because it visits uh, uh, vertices uh, several times. But what is the total length of this route in terms of the size of the, sp the spanning tree? It's twice. Each edge is traversed once, uh, going in uh, uh, forward and then one backwards, right? So we get that this uh, root, uh, let's call it rho, is uh, uh, of length uh, smaller or equal than uh, two times the size of MST, right? Now, Notice we haven't used this property for the, at all. Now we simply take shortcuts, right? For example, we simply, oh, uh, well, let me see. Um, you replace uh, uh, one at a time, right? If you have a piece that looks like this, right? You simply replace this by a shortcut directly from here to here. So instead you go like this, and then uh, you replace this by another shortcut. So you will go like this, so you go here, here, then you jump to first non-visited vertex, and then from there you jump again to the next non-visited. And now, each in each step, we replace the length of these two segments, right, with the length of this segment. But they form a triangle, and so the sum total of these two edges will be bigger or equal than the length of that edge. So after this operation, you will get, uh, let's call it rho star, and it cannot increase uh, the size, this contraction business, so will be smaller or equal to twice minimal sp uh, spanning tree, but we saw that the size of minimal spanning tree is smaller or equal uh, than uh, opt. So two times this is smaller or equal than two times opt. And voila, if the map uh, is metric, right, then this algorithm allows you to produce a root that is at most twice in size of the optimal root, right? So that all looks nice, but this is not satisfied, for example, for a roadmaps, right? So what happens if we drop the condition that the, the graph is metric? Well, let's see what happens then. Uh, maybe we won't be able to, um, to find twice as uh, a big root in general. Maybe we just have to be 
uh, less optimistic, maybe it would be enough. Maybe we can still find a root that is at most 100 times the length of optimal root. Yeah, and if this is not enough, surely 1,000 times uh, uh, bigger should solve the problem. But amazingly enough, this shows some, uh, it, this is not the case. There is no integer k, uh, no matter how large you choose it, uh, so that you can always, uh, so that you can find uh, a polynomial time algorithm that produces a root that is at most k times optimal, no matter how big you, k you choose. So this shows that NP-hard problems, even though in a sense all NP-complete problems are equally hard because they are p-time reducible to each other, NP-hard problems actually can have uh, very different feasibility properties because some, like metric saveling salesman problem, in fact do allow decent approximation, um, namely twice. In fact, this is improved, can be with a trickier, uh, with some uh, graph theoretic uh, kind of results, you can reduce 2 to 1.5, one and a half times larger. But if you drop this, then no matter how large factor you choose, there is no feasible algorithm that um, solves, uh, that produces such an approximation. So let's see why this is the case. It's a very uh, beautiful and uh, simple solution. Uh, we are going to show that, uh, uh, in fact, finding Hamiltonian cycle in a graph, if you had an approximation, so uh, if a uh, traveling salesman problem had a k approximation for arbitrary, any k, no matter how large you pick it, uh, uh, has, uh, if it had a, a k approximation, uh, then a Hamiltonian circuit problem uh, would be in P. And uh, it is known, it's one of the original CARPs um, reductions, we know that Hamiltonian circuit is actually NP-complete, as hard as uh, the um, uh, satisfiability problem. How do we show, so what we are going to show is that if we had K approximation algorithm, we could, we can polynomial time, uh, we can solve uh, Hamiltonian circuit in polynomial time. And the idea is uh, very simple. Uh, assume that uh, G has uh, N edges. Uh, okay. So we assume that uh, G uh, has N edges. Uh, and uh, we now um, and assume that uh, uh, there exists a p-time algorithm Uh, such that uh, it produces a uh, traveling salesman problem uh, solution of uh, size at most uh, 
k times opt. Okay? Now we are going to turn this instance of Hamiltonian cycle into a traveling salesman problem by connecting all pairs of vertices that do not have an edge in the graph with a graph of the weight k times n. So the distances between these two points will be k times n. Okay? So if there was no edge before, we introduce an edge and uh, uh, set its weight to be k times n, and all existing edges will get a weight of 1. Right? Now, because we assumed that we have, what is, uh, you see, so now there will be an optimal solution um, if there exists a Hamiltonian circuit, what will be the size of optimal solution of the traveling salesman problem here? So there will be a Hamiltonian circuit if you can traverse a course uh, uh, along the edges, right, come back every vertex visited once. If all the edges are inside, uh, belong to your graph, what would be the weight of the trajectory? It will be exactly n, right? Because then all edges would be of uh, size 1. And there are n vertices, so the traveling salesman root will be at most n, right? Well, but now by our assumption, we will have, uh, <coughs> if this is the case, then the traveling salesman problem here will be, we will be, it will be possible to find a solution of size at most k times n, right? Because this is our assumption. We have a solution to traveling salesman problem that is at most k times as large. But when can this happen? This happens precisely, right, if uh, no edge no non-existing edge was used. Because if a non-existing edge was used, then at least one of these will be k times n. So the sum total would be k times n plus at n minus one of these, which is bigger than k times n. So if you had a polynomial time algorithm that can always produce k times opt solution, the only possible solution is one that is entirely in the graph because if you, once you have an edge that is not in the graph, you are above your limit, right? This is bigger than k times n. So your polynomial time solution will find precisely the Hamiltonian circuit. Huh? And this is clearly impossible, right? So what does this mean? It means that life is bloody difficult. Huh? It means that for some problems you can approximate. What happens if you do have, if you are a mailman and you do have, and it's, uh, you have, or some delivery, to, you know, a logistics company, a transportation company, then you simply try heuristics and you simply try by some ad hoc analysis to find as good a route as possible and you don't try to solve it by an algorithmic method, a kind of general algorithmic method, right? So that's the moral of the story and its uh, importance of this material is because NP hard problems are ubiquitous. So you have to know what you do when you encounter one. Okay, so I'll see you then. If you want to see the proof of Cook's theorem, you come now or uh, watch on YouTube uh, extended class. <laughs>